Hello, uh, we hope you're enjoying the practical ophthalmology lecture series that's being put together for ophthalmology medical students as well as uh, primary care doctors and emergency medicine doctors who are interested in developing some practical ophthalmology tips. Today we're going to be talking about the pupils in the primary care setting. Just a few facts that you might want to know uh, when talking about pupils. The content of this uh, lecture revolves the around the normal pupillary response, a relative afferent pupillary defect, optic neuritis, and other classic pupil scenarios that we think you should be aware of. Let's start things off with a question. We were told about a 32-year-old white female who presents to the emergency department with a chief complaint of a two-day history of painful eye movements and blurry vision of her right eye. On review of systems, she also mentions that she has been experiencing some numbness and tingling in her fingertips over the last week, which is unusual for her. You page the ophthalmology service to initiate a consult. When they ask about her pupil exam, what clinical finding is most relevant to her likely condition? I want you to take a moment to read over the answers, pause the video, and think about it for a second. Okay, good. If you chose answer A, you chose the correct response. The swinging flashlight test when moving quickly from the left eye to the right eye demonstrates a slightly dilated pupil, and we're going to go over this in just a moment. Uh, the other answers are inappropriate. Both eyes sluggish in their reactive time to light. Many things can cause that. The right eye constricting to direct light uh, stimulation. That's a normal response. Both pupils being fixed and dilated. That can be a sign of a, a brain stem lesion. Let's talk about the normal pupil response. Now, you've been over this before in uh, neurology, but we'll review it again. Now, when you shine a light in the left eye, what happens? Well, the first thing that gets stimulated, first thing that gets initi initiated is the signal cascade. The retina uh, photoreceptors in the back of the eye send a signal that travels all the way back through the optic chiasm into a nucleus known as the pretectal nucleus. The pretectal nucleus will then send fibers to the Edinger-Westphal nucleus on the same side and the Edinger-Westphal nucleus on the contralateral side. And why is this important? Well, this is critical to the normal intact consensual response. So when you shine light into that left eye, as you very well notice, the right eye constricts as well. The pathway is completed as fibers from those that Edinger-Westphal nucleus travel to the ciliary ganglion where they synapse and then become the short ciliary nerves which innervate the sphincter pupillae to cause pupillary constriction. Now all that has to be intact in order to have an appropriate consensual response. So let's talk about what happens when you have a relative afferent pupillary defect. This is caused by an incomplete optic nerve lesion or can be caused by severe retinal disease. We mentioned those a few of those in the previous lecture series. The pupil response in the diseased eye is weak while it remains brisk in the normal eye. Now the key distinction in doing this swinging a flashlight test is that when the normal eye is stimulated, both pupils are able to constrict. The, when the light is swung from the diseased right eye, or is swung to the diseased right eye, the stimulus for constriction is reduced. So both eyes are going to dilate instead of constricting. And when you swing back to the normal eye, both pupils constrict. Now there's a YouTube video I'd like to show you which demonstrates this clearly. In this patient, you will see that the right pupil consistently dilates as the light is swung toward it. This dilation is called a relative afferent pupillary defect. It usually signifies that an optic nerve lesion is present on the side of the dilating pupil. Okay, so we have an understanding of what a relevant, relative afferent pupillary defect looks like. Let's talk about a few causes of these RAPDs. So the number one thing we want you to think of in ophthalmology is optic neuritis. 
number one cause of optic neuritis is multiple sclerosis. And we all know about that and learned about that in medical school. What that is is an autoimmune uh, demyelinating disease uh, where uh, patients many times will come in with optic neuritis as the number one uh, initial presenting sign for having multiple sclerosis. A few, fee, a few key clinical findings that you can appreciate in the, an optic neuritis attack is the color desaturation test, which is where patients have trouble with distinguishing between the brightness of a red cap. So for example, if a patient had optic neuritis of their left eye, the red cap in the normal right eye would appear a little bit washed out, less bright. This is why we're always performing color vision tests in patients to assess the health of their optic nerve. Now we know about the optic neuritis workup for MS. You're going to want to get an MRI with flare sequencing to look for classic white matter lesions in the periventricular area. Another thing that patients with MS can get is a paracentral scotoma when they have optic neuritis. That is, they have kind of a blurring spot in their central field of vision. Now there's other causes of RAPDs including severe retinal ischemia which we talked about in a previous lecture and also another one that we want to talk about is orbital compression. Squeezing on the optic nerve can cause this type of uh, pathology and there's many different types of uh, disease entities that can cause pressure on the nerve. Those include orbital cellulitis, a retrobulbar hematoma, a malignancy or even Graves disease where the extraocular muscles are, are inflamed and in hypertrophy to the point where it's squeezing on the nerve. So orbital cellulitis. This is a really big one that you should know as a pediatric resident, uh, general medicine resident, emergency room resident. You can end up saving someone's vision or even possibly their life if you if you detect this and work it up appropriately. So we have a question. You're at Coast Air Children's Hospital in the emergency department asked to evaluate a five-year-old boy who presents with a chief complaint of swollen red right eye for about one and a half days. The mom denies any history of trauma, although she states the, the patient has had a runny nose and cough for, for about four, four or five days. On exam, which of the following pictures uh, make you want to go ahead and get CT imaging of the head in orbits? Take a second to look over the questions, pause the video. If you chose answer A, you chose the appropriate findings. Now the, the key thing to note here is that when this patient is looking all the way to the right, they cannot get their left eye all the way over in adduction. So they have a motility deficit, suggestive of orbital cellulitis. This is preceptal cellulitis, erythema, some swelling, um, same thing here, and then this is just bacterial conjunctivitis. So let's talk about the anatomy. You need to know the anatomy in order to understand orbital cellulitis uh, or uh, preceptal cellulitis. So the septum is basically a barrier for the ability of um, infections such as staph, such as Haemophilus influenza, to travel to the back of the orbit. There's this fat pad here that kind of prevents the migration of, of pathogens to get back. The exam itself is usually fairly obvious whether or not it's orbital cellulitis or preceptal. I mentioned the motility deficit that the patient's going to have. They're going to have a, rel a relative afferent pupillary defect. They're also going to have extensive conjunctival chemosis. Now that's in the classic setting. Certainly there are exceptions. Well, what, you're, what you're usually going to see is tremendous swelling of the conjunctiva and a ton of erythema, which we can appreciate here. This little guy only has preceptal cellulitis, just some swelling and uh, mild erythema. The associated CT scans are, are, are seen below. Um, what we see here is preceptal inflammation, maybe some soft, uh, some, some soft tissue swelling, possibly a little bit of air over here, but again, nothing behind the septum looks fine, which is in co direct contrast to this CT scan, which shows a possible abscess along the track of the medial rectus muscle and clearly shows proptosis 
of the eye itself. It's sticking a little bit further out than its other healthy eye. What are some other pupil tips we'd like you to know? There is something known as physiologic anisocoria. 20% of the population in general has a one millimeter difference between their pupils. The key thing to know about this is that the pupil difference is the same in the light as it is in the dark. For example, in this patient, their left eye is a little bit bigger than their right eye, and this kind of holds true in both the light and the dark. Another thing you need to be aware of is something, is something called pharmacologic metriasis. Classic scenario for this for ophthalmology residents at UofL is when patients are, are given a scopolamine patch for, uh, anti, for to help provide anti-nausea relief after they've had anesthesia. If the patient ends up having exposure on their hand or the nurse has exposure on their hand of the patch and it somehow gets to their eye, they can end up having a, a pupil um, that is dilated and we can get a phone call to investigate the matter. Many times we'll be able to find the source if we look on their back for that patch. Another thing that you need to be concerned considering when you see unequal pupils is the classic Horner syndrome. In this one you're going to see meiosis, you're going to see ptosis, and you're going to see anhydrosis. And there's many causes of that including strokes, a pancreas tumor from lung cancer, carotid artery dissections. The classic scenario is when a patient goes to a chiropractor for manipulation and then also cluster headaches. A little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but when you're diagnosing Horner's, there's certain pathways they can use. One of the things that we used to do was give cocaine to see if the patient's uh, pupils were able to come to dilate in response. If they are, then it's not a sign of Horner's. Some other pupil tips, there's also something called an 80s pupil. An 80s tonic pupil is one that is a large regular pupil that's just basically you can think of it as a slug. It doesn't react quickly to anything. Um, on direct stimulation it's got a sluggish response. On the consensual response it's diminished as well. And the pupil also moves slower when focusing for near or refocusing for distance viewing. Now the ideology of this is usually uh, post-viral although a, a lot of different things can cause it. It can be caused by some of the various dysautonomic syndromes uh, that you learn about in endocrinology. Another pupil scenario that you need to be aware of is the Argyll-Robertson pupil. Now what are the signs of this? This is someone who has pupils that are small in dim light, which is atypical. Usually when you're in the dark your pupils are going to be bigger because you're trying to get as much light as you can. Uh, back to your photoreceptors in your retina. And this is also someone who, in bright light, the pupil does not constrict to limit the amount of light getting in. However, one of the critical things to note here is that when accommodation is utilized, that is when the patient is made to focus on a near tar target, both pupils are able to constrict. Now this is demonstrating this figure up here you see a poor consensual response when light is shown into the left eye, but when the patient's asked to read, they're able to constrict their pupils, comparing here to here. The ideology of this includes neurosyphilis. That's the classic one we learn about. Obviously, you're going to want to get an RPR value. Chronic alcoholism can cause it, as well as dorsal midbrain syndromes from a stroke. This concludes Lecture number two of the series, I hope you enjoyed it.